Welcome to the second episode of Talking Texas. Today we're going to be talking some Texas baseball with Hornets 24-7's Jeff Howe. Jeff, you just got back from Greenville. You're about to head to Omaha. Can you quickly just recap kind of the super regional uh, regional at the jungle? Yeah. Oh, man. The only thing I can compare it to is, you know, if you've ever been to a football game in Stillwater, when, when it's really charged up there, that's the only thing I can compare it to with uh, with more alcohol, though, probably. Um, it lived up to the – I mean, surpassed the hype. It was the ECU fans, they were they were into it. It, it. From a baseball crowd standpoint, I mean, it kind of reminds you of going to a game in College Station where, man, they are just into every single pitch. Um, so it was a pretty pretty raucous crowd. And I'll tell you what, like the, the Saturday game, you know, after Texas lost on Friday, the Saturday game, Hudson, that was one where going into the ballpark. I mean, that, that fan base was ready for a party. I mean, they'd never been to Omaha. They were ready to pop the court. And when Texas started that rally, started in the bottom of the seventh with, uh, you know, Doug Hodo's two-run home run. And then when, you know, they tied it, took the lead on the Skylar Messenger three-run home run, then the Dylan Campbell home run, man, the air just completely went out of that place. And you could feel it from the fans, uh, even talking to some of the writers, you know, you could sense it. Just the tightness of being, you know, six outs from Omaha really, really got to them. And, you know, the Sunday game going through, you know, I don't know how long of weather delays we got to. I think the game was supposed to start at, at 4 Eastern, and I think it was probably about six hours later when things started back up after the second delay. So it was a long day at the park. But um, you could tell the, the energy was – Good, but not the same. It wasn't as rabid. You could tell. I think Cliff Godwin even said it. The ECU head coach said it after the loss on Sunday. They and Saturday was their chance to do it, and they didn't get it done. And that was a Texas team that you let them off the mat. That's the one thing I'll say about this team, man. They, they did they have their flaws? Yeah. Have they struggled at times this year? Absolutely. But if you're going to beat Texas, man, you this Texas team, you've got to drive the stake through the heart stomp on the throat and like watch them die because if they've got a breath left they will fight and claw and scratch for everything so it it was a great weekend of baseball Hudson like just an awesome weekend of baseball and it ends with uh well Texas going to Omaha and and they of the eight teams there with Tennessee out of the field Texas has as good a case as any for for one in the whole thing Jeff, it's a really interesting point you made about really having to drive the stake through this team because a fellow uh, Omaha member in Oklahoma learned that lesson better than anybody this year with Texas coming back on them during the regular season series yeah. finale. And then in the Big 12 tournament finale, they understood, you know, we have to beat this team down into submission. Real quick, though, I just can you kind of expand on what was going through your mind during the weather delays? Obviously, you were keeping uh, you were on tarp watch. You were keeping everybody up to date on Twitter. I think our your live update thread ended up with almost 200,000 page views. Yeah, it was like a 195 this morning, I think. Yeah, exactly. Like, what was that like for you personally? Um, I, you know. I've been through it before, weather delays. You know, the one that immediately I thought of was the 2013 football game at TCU, which I think ended, I don't know, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so that was wild. Um, and, and, you know, you've been through I didn't. I wasn't no, – I was not in Provo in 2013 for that weather delay. But, yeah, I've been through it. But I, I think it was – you know, once you kind of got over the fact, okay, well, you know, if they knew the storm system was going through, why'd they even start the game? And, you know, you could have put it, but then, then Texas is up for nothing when it starts. You know, I wasn't freaking out like some other, you know, I had, uh, you know, planned ahead in case there was weather or the game got bumped back. They had to bump it to Monday for whatever reason. Um, I got a late flight out. I got the last flight out on Monday. I had a hotel room for that night. So I was fine. I wasn't freaking out in terms of that. Um, I was really interested, though, and David Pierce kind of confirmed this after the game. There was a point as the delay went on, probably so it was almost five hours. I'd say probably two and a half, three hours into it. You know, the ECU guys started to come out of the dugout and were kind of playing to the fans that were there. And it almost, I don't know, you could almost still see the tension on them, like trying to keep loose. With Texas, I could even see guys in the dugout. It was just like, hey, 
we've been here before because they have. Like you go back to Omaha last year, that delay against Mississippi State, and I asked David Pierce about that after the game, and he said, "Look, with, with this team, they're so mature. Yes, they're talented, but it's such a mature team. It's a veteran team. They've been there before." He said he didn't have to give a whole lot of instructions during the delay. You know, reminding guys, "Hey, either stay off your feet." Or, or get loose or get your fluids or whatever it was, he said guys just kind of were to themselves and he just let them be. And when it was – he would give them updates as he was getting them. I, I do think he didn't confirm this. I do think at one point – I think they caught him mid-nap maybe because one of those coaches meetings on the field. No joke, like he came out. I don't even know if he had slides on. He might have just been in his socks and stirrups and and uh, <laughs> and lo- it looked like you know he his hair looked like he just woken up from a nap, so he didn't confirm or deny that. But um, no, they, Texas was just pretty chill, pretty relaxed. And then, um, so me during the delay, I, I didn't really worry about the Texas team because you almost felt like okay, they've been here, they can handle this. My focus was on how much of this crowd is going to come back after this delay. Now the jungle was packed. Uh, they let the people in the jungle back in early, and I think there was even portions where it was pouring buckets that there were people there. But, you know, the fans in the stands, they were still loud, but it just wasn't that – it wasn't that f- that f- that fever pitch that it got to, definitely on Saturday, but even at the start of the game Sunday. And, you know, the Ivan Melendez bomb kind of took the air out a little bit. And uh, I think at that point it's almost like that was a fan base that kind of knew that they had missed their chance. So I was just wondering how many of the, the fans would come back. and then. Really, the other thing was, man, okay, you don't worry about this team, but you worry about Tristan Stevens. Like, that's a guy, he's been a high usage guy down the stretch. Um, he'd already gotten himself warmed up. Now, and again, talking to him about it after the game, it's like it's just a, the balance of just trusting the trainer stuff. Okay, do you need heat on your shoulder? Do you need nothing on it? Like, what do you do? And so, how was he going to respond? And man, a little shaky in the first inning, but once he got through that first, uh, lights out the rest of the way. So, yeah, I, it just, you know, I didn't really have a whole lot to do. I, I wrote a story on Ivan Melendez setting the, the BB Core era home run record and just kind of kind of hung out and was on tarp watch and watching the radar and kind of doing what everybody else was. Not a not a whole lot. The, the press box, Hudson, I don't think is as interesting or as fascinating as some people might think. It is. You're just kind of sitting there twiddling your thumbs for the most part during the life, especially when there's nothing to write. There are no updates. So just kind of hanging out, trying to pass the time. Gotcha. And Jeff, Ray, I think- honestly, honestly, though, like I, I mentioned this in the thread, I want to thank everybody that was in the thread and participated. Uh, you know, all our people in the flagship message board uh, that have been following baseball coverage all year. That that group was was awesome on Sunday. Yeah, all except for like one, and that person <laughs> will, <laughs> but will remain uh, unnamed. But Jeff, you kind of mentioned with Tristan Stevens. I think that's the perfect segue into some actual Omaha talk. Obviously, the lineup has been rolling, but Stevens getting out of that first inning with only one and then just shutting it down and starting to shove for the rest of the game really kind of gave Texas another look with him maybe still getting a little bit of relief work, but potentially with Tristan as a third starter now in that confirmed spot. How do you think that he can kind of keep up this momentum as Texas potentially heads into uh, Omaha? You know, it's funny when we've talked about the football program. Uh, you know, Rod Babers, who's my colleague on the Longhorn Blitz podcast. You know, Rod has a big, he's big on man. There's some guys that come to Texas to play at Texas, and there's some guys that come to Texas to play for Texas. And there's a really big difference. And Tristan Stevens is one of those guys that came to Texas to play for Texas. He didn't come to play at Texas, he came to play for Texas. And I think when you combine just his passion, his love for this program, along with the fact that, you know, pro aspirations for him kind of are what they are after not getting drafted last year. Uh, he's going to do – he says this, but he really means it, Hudson. Like, he, he he will do whatever David Pierce and Sean Allen and Troy Tulowitzki and that staff, whatever they need him to do to win baseball games. I think for him uh, – you know, and I think this goes for the rest of the bullpen guys too. One thing he talked about in that first inning is when you get guys on base, man, you just have to try to minimize – Right? You don't have to be perfect, just minimize. You've got maybe the best defense in the country behind you, and you've got an offense that's going to give you run support. Like You don't have to be perfect, just minimize. Something Drake Duplante talked about after his game on Saturday, which, I mean, honestly, he made 36 pitches, he made one mistake. Yep. And, yeah, 
Jacob Starling deposited, you know, 300, 400 some odd feet to left field, but it was one mistake and he was really good. Uh, Stevens the same way in the Sunday game. So I think it's just understanding just you need you minimize you, that you, you're going to have stuff around you to help you get through those rough spots. So I do think, too, the way the College World Series is structured, where it's not like a regional or a super regional and you've got the built in day off. You can kind of do whatever you need him to do. Like, let's say, and a lot of it's going to depend on what you get out of Pete Hansen and Lucas Gordon. Like, let's say, you know, Pete Hansen gives you against Notre Dame. Let's say he gives you seven and you need Tristan for six outs. And if those six outs are low stress pitches, okay, you've got no problem using them maybe in a more extended role on uh, what would that be on Sunday? Uh, and then if you stay in the winner's bracket and get the extra day off, now the next game you would play, you would have another day off, and now maybe he can start. I, I think Hudson, I think what they're going to do, David Pierce has talked about this, and then you know, kind of pick, picking some stuff from behind the scenes in their pitching plan. I, I think really it's it's Hanson, it's Gordon, and then when you when the third game comes up, I think at that point you see okay. You know, who's had high stress pitches, who hasn't pitched, what's the situation, what's the opponent. Oh, there's a lot that's gonna go into it. So I think for this stat, if it is Stevens that starts a third game in Omaha, I don't think it's gonna be as simple as okay, he was really good in the supers in the game third in the third game. Just put him in that number three role. I don't think it's gonna be that simple. There's gonna be a lot that goes into it. Then and again, that third game is gonna depend on what that situation is. I think it would be more likely to be Stevens uh if it's if it's an elimination game. Uh, yeah. But if if it's a winner's bracket game where you've got the extra day off, maybe now you feel like okay, maybe the maybe you can piece together with the bullpen. What's Pete? Hey, what's Pete's availability at that point? Could he maybe come back? Uh, depending on when you're playing, maybe move him a day up. So I, I again, I just, if you're a Texas fan, I, I don't. I think after Hanson and Gordon, I wouldn't try to draw too many conclusions about what that number three role is going to look like because Tristan, they haven't changed it. His role still going to be. TBD the whole way through. That makes a ton of sense, Jeff. Obviously, now talking about Omaha, six out of the eight teams in Omaha had to win at least some of their regional or super regional on the road. Only two teams hosted throughout in Stanford and Texas A&M. You've got Texas matching up with a Notre Dame squad who I had a friend mention to me kind of reminded them of last year's NC State team with the knocking off the number one in the super Notre Dame has only beaten ranked competition. Uh, and they went down to Statesboro, took out Georgia Southern and Texas. In a good, in a good regional. Yeah, that Statesboro regional was a good, that was a loaded regional. Yeah. Exactly. And then to go into Knoxville and to take game one and then game three from Tennessee, that kind of shows you what that ball club is made out of. And Texas has them in a primetime spot. When you look at this Notre Dame uh, squad, Jeff, what stands out to you? Because for me, it's kind of the depth that they have in the pitching rotation. They do have some good hitters, but what uh, true freshman Jack Finley has been able to do out of the bullpen going four or five innings at a time. Um, and they kind of, Notre Dame kind of uses an opener a lot of times where they'll throw a guy you know, just for four outs, for five outs, and then just throw a ton of looks. What stands out to you about this Notre Dame? Yeah, I'm still in the middle of my Notre Dame prep, but I think one thing, going back to the Tennessee series, I think the way – and first of all, let me say this about Notre Dame. Like, Link Jarrett obviously has done a phenomenal job with that program. They should have been a regional host. I mean, you, you, you look last year, last year they were deserving of a top eight and didn't get a top eight. This year, they were very deserving to be a, a host, one of 16 hosts, and they weren't. Uh, and like you said, had to go on a road, win a tough stage for a regional. I think probably what's interesting is maybe the way they handled it. Because Tennessee, look, Tennessee, there's no secret what they're going to throw at you. I mean, they're throwing high velo guys at you, whether you're talking about Dollander or Burns or Joyce, whoever you're talking about. Tennessee, they, they'll run the high velo guys out there. I think the way they handled that, I think handling in that environment, that's not – if you look at their pitching, Hudson, that's not an easy place to pitch in. Yeah, I mean, Lindsey Nelson, it's a, it's a hitter-friendly park. So <clears throat> all that considered, um, to go in there and beat Tennessee, uh, I, you've got to be really impressed with Notre Dame. But I, I, when I look at this field period, the one thing – and I, I know there's a lot of college baseball fans that are okay for a lot of reasons for Tennessee not being in Omaha. <laughs> but, but for me, 
Uh, and that's neither here nor there for me. But for me, with Tennessee out of it, like if Tennessee was in this field, all you if Texas was playing Tennessee on Friday, all you would hear about was, is ten, you taking Tennessee or the field? Like in Tennessee, this, this incredibly historic, impressive year they've had, the best regular season SEC record ever, win the SEC tournament, you know, go to Omaha. Can they finish the job? Can they finish off what would be one of the best Division One baseball seasons we've seen in a long time? But now that Tennessee's out of it, now you start looking deeper. Man, everybody's got a story. You know, with Texas, I'll get to Texas in a second, but like AM, Jim Schlossnagel's first year getting into Omaha. Oklahoma's probably the hottest team in the country right now. Yeah. Notre, Notre Dame goes into Tennessee and slays the dragon, uh, goes into Knoxville and slays the dragon in Tennessee. Ole Miss barely got into the tournament. And there was a lot of people that thought they shouldn't have been in. And they're in, you know, Stanford, the resurgence sure. they've had in the post Mark Marquis era. You know, Auburn going out to Corvallis and, and winning a really tough regional. Uh, and then Arkansas, I mean, you talk about a team. We talk about a team that had to win on the road and win some tough games to get to Omaha. Uh, I don't know that a lot of people at Arkansas coming out of Stillwater. And so everybody's got a story. And then for Texas, to me, when I look at Texas, I, I, I go back to after the 2019 season, after 27 and 27. I remember being on the field with David Pierce after they finished up a series with Oklahoma. They, they didn't go to the Big 12 tournament that year. And he said, I'll paraphrase here. He said, there's going to be a lot of changes because I'm not going to sit here ever again at the end of a season and be 27 and 27. He made a change on the coaching staff and brought in Troy Tulowitzki. And you think about that core group of guys that were newcomers in 2020, the COVID shortened year. Uh, the guys that were newcomers that year, that's Murphy Stelly, Trey Faltini, Silas Ardon, Doug Hodo, Pete Hansen, Jared Southerd. So that core group of guys, and you know, Cam Constantine's on the travel roster, Peyton Powell's not, but those are the guys that are left over from that recruiting class. That group, Hudson, right there, since they got together at the start of the 2020 season, they're 111 and 40. They've won a Big 12 title. They've now been to Omaha twice. The storyline for Texas for me is the only thing missing from that core group and what's probably going to, because you got a lot there, yeah, those guys are sophomores. They're all draft eligible, and a lot of those guys are going to get drafted and sign pro contracts most likely. The last run for this core group at Texas, can they get the one thing missing off of their resume as a group and win a national championship? Jeff, we're going to take a quick break. If you're watching on YouTube, we'll just continue as normal. Okay, and we're back. Jeff, I kind of want to get your thoughts on this Texas A&M-Oklahoma game where regardless of what Texas does against Notre Dame, they're going to face one of their biggest rivals, either in an elimination game with the yeah. potential two and Q in Omaha or a chance to really set the tone in that left side of the bracket. What do you think is going to happen in this Texas A&M-Oklahoma game? And this is a little bit of an impossible question. I've been asked this, and I've uh, pled the fifth, but who would you rather face if you're Texas? Oh boy. Um hmm. okay. I'll handle the last part first. I think you would rather face AM. Well, no, let me phrase that. I think you would rather face Oklahoma because that would be the fifth time you've seen them this year. So whether you're talking about arms, style of play, there's not a whole lot of things that Oklahoma can do to surprise you. Now, Texas saw and plus. Texas saw Oklahoma earlier in the year before they got on that hot streak, and they saw them again in the Big 12 tournament. So for Texas facing Oklahoma, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, Spikerman coming back and being healthy, Kendall Pettis back being healthy, Trevor Michael to back into the bullpen, uh, you know, Kate Horton on the mound, who I would imagine in a second game they would probably see Horton most likely with uh, with Jake Bennett throwing the, the A&M game. Oklahoma doesn't have anything they're going to surprise you with. Uh, you know, not that they wouldn't have scouted AM or haven't scouted AM. Uh, and I believe I want to say I can't remember if Nathan, if Detmer or Micah Dallas, one of them threw got the final three outs in the midweek game in Austin. But you'd have to go a little more expansive to scout AM a little bit, so maybe there's a little bit more of an unknown. Uh, but I think overall, I think you'd rather see Oklahoma just because you you know you know what you're getting into facing Oklahoma. Uh, I forgot. You know, that's a drug on there. What was the other part of the question? 
just what you think, how you kind of forecast personally just that game. Not No Texas angle, just what do you think is going to happen when the Aggies face the Sooners in that game? Yeah, uh, let's assume it's Jake Bennett starting for OU. Um, you know, that matchup, that, that A&M lineup, man, that's a good lineup with a lot of tough outs, one through nine. Um, so Jake Bennett versus the A&M offense is what everybody's going to be keen on. But my thing is, you know, A&M, it's going to be their ability to hold runners. You realize, like, Oklahoma, I think, has 142 stolen bases as a team. I mean, Peyton Graham, Peyton Graham's got the first 20 home uh, twenty home run, 30 stolen base season in OU history. Uh, you know, Kendall Pettis coming back from the elbow injury. I mean, they, they can run. Like, Skip Johnson has basically built – an amplified version of like what team Augie Garrido would love to coach. Like they can pitch, they play defense and man, they can run, they can utilize a short game. They can score runs in a number of different ways. So that's, that's the fascinating matchup for me. Like if it's Detmer on the mound, his ability to hold runners. And if A&M can shut down the OU run game, if that can happen, I would like A&M's chances a lot in that game, but man, it, it's, it's tough to bet against Oklahoma right now. Again, as hot as they play, they, they go down to Gainesville and win the regional, then go to Blacksburg and knock off a national seed. Um, again, man, there's so many intriguing storylines with everybody in Omaha. And for me, that, like I said, Oklahoma, of all these eight teams, they might be playing better than anybody right now. I'm with you on that part, and especially considering how Florida entered the tournament and going down the yeah. field. And plus, like you said, with that Blacksburg super, oh my goodness, they, they uh, you know, really blitzed Virginia Tech off of their own uh, diamond. So that was pretty crazy to see. One more thing, Jeff, that I kind of want to pick your brain on when it comes to Omaha. A lot of times when you do end up at the College World Series, somebody unexpected kind of takes that next jump and has a great couple of days. I feel like last year, I don't know if you would agree, but last year was probably Eric Kennedy who was struggling a little bit, got to Omaha and just started raking. When I look at this Texas lineup though, Jeff, it feels ridiculous to say, but I don't really see an unexpected guy because all nine hitters have proved throughout the postseason that they can come up in the clutch when it's time. Faltini, Dylan Campbell, even Silas got on the board with a solo jack, even though the stakes weren't high. But yeah. and, and then, you know, in the six hole, Skylar Messenger's what hitting basically 375 to all yeah. fields. So this, with the with, spray with, with, double, with double digit home runs, yeah. Exactly. So it's just one of those things where Texas's six through nine hitters, you can't pick on them. And I don't know that that's something you've necessarily been able to say on previous Omaha squads for the long run. No. Not even mentioning that Ivan Melendez and Murphy Staley might be the best one-two punch in college baseball. Yeah, like going back to the to the Greenville Super, the third game, what broke it open. I mean, yeah, Tristan was awesome, and Ivan's home run to set the record um, got it started. But you go back, you, the second inning, it's a 5-1 game after Kennedy singles. Wild pitch puts runners in scoring position. You got first base over with no outs. And you intentionally walk Ivan, which I don't blame you if you're Cliff Godwin, but you're walking him to get to Murph, walking him to get to a second team All American who's hitting th over 370 with 19 bombs. And he came through with the two run single and, you know, broke the game open at a five run, five run second. Um, I'll give you one guy, though. Um, and, and talking to some of the ECU writers when they started studying Texas, some of the guys were telling me this. And when you look at Trey Faltini, there's like only a couple things that are going to happen when he comes to play based on his numbers throughout the year. Basically he's either hitting an extra base hitter to strike out. And I felt like in the, in the third game, he worked a walk in that game. He had a single in that game uh, to help get that big inning started. So I think Trey fault, it's Trey fault ability to get on base and help the bottom of the lineup be productive if he's productive, and Ivan said, the other guys have said this, man, when Trey gets going, this offense goes to another level. If you get him in the nine hole, because, again, all those guys at the top of the order, Hodo's got double-digit home runs. Kennedy's got nine, so he's one away from joining the club. And then, you know, you go three, four, five with Melendez, Staley, and Todd. If Faltini can get on base and, you know, take, take walks and then you know, take good productive at-bats, that's the guy who I think takes this offense from as good as it is to to even another level. 
That's a great point, Jeff. And it's kind of that maturity with this Texas team having been in these spots of knowing it's the postseason. We're changing the approach a little bit. And I think that plays to their advantage considering the fact that a lot of teams get to Omaha, the park plays big, and they kind of, uh, you know, you know, sometimes uh, they can kind of get away with getting some 310 home runs and uh, some Mickey Mouse parks. And then, you know, when you get to Omaha, it's not like that. So, no. I guess but, one but I'll say this, I'll say this too, Hudson, like that. I, you know, Texas, this club from a mentality standpoint, man, they, they don't change much. Like, you, you think about all the times throughout the year where it had a chance to really get away from them. Like the road trip to the Carolinas, it had a chance to get away from them. Uh, you know, the 14 2 midweek loss to Air Force. Like, think about that. Of all the teams Texas played, of all the losses they've taken, their worst loss of the year was that Tuesday loss to Air Force, that 14 2 loss. Uh, you know, getting swept at home by Oklahoma State, losing the K State series on Easter weekend. Like, there were a lot of times where th- it could have just come unraveled and this team could have just fallen apart. But they haven't. I think if you're a Texas fan, that's what you admire about this team. And they do so much to keep themselves in the fight. And I think now that they're in Omaha from a mentality standpoint, like they expected to be here. And that's the other thing with Texas that some of these other teams don't have. They've been to Omaha. They know what it takes to win in Omaha. And they got so close last year. And I think now I do think – I don't know if you'll see a different mindset, but I think you'll see a different energy from Texas that, okay, through all that stuff, they got back here. They got back to Omaha. Now can you go finish the job? Jeff, real quick before we get to some kind of final predictions from both of us, can I get a takeaway uh, from you for the right side of the bracket? My personal one is just I want to just see Sonny D from Auburn break. That's kind of my main takeaway, but just out of curiosity. Stanford's intriguing to me, and and I kind of got a, a good look at Stanford uh, because Texas State was in the Palo Alto Regional that, uh, boy, you talk about heartbreak, really man. They should have won. Bobcats, the Bobcats were three outs away from hosting Hudson. They would have Bobcat yep. ballpark. It would have been the Herbert's Taco Hut Super Regional down in San Marcos on the river, um, but it didn't happen. And, uh, you know, Stanford's intriguing uh, because, you know, you think about the way Sunken Diamond plays. You think about uh, typically how a West Coast team would be built, but they've got some thump. You know, they can pitch. And like you said, you made a good point, man. I, I don't know why you can just call it New Rosenblatt. Charles Schwab Field. It plays a little. It plays a little bit different, especially if that wind is blowing in uh, from center. It plays a little bit different. So I think stylistically, I think it can help Stanford a little bit. That's the team that, again, you know, having Texas State, which was a really good two seed. I didn't think I thought Texas State was good enough to not have to go to a top eight, but they won a tough regional. You know, beat UConn, but I think Stanford. Stanford's kind of the team that. Yeah, I've seen it, but they might be the one that I really don't know that much about, which makes them intriguing for me. And then, like, like I said, like the other one is Ole Miss. Like Ole Miss wasn't even supposed to be here, but you know they had the RPI. Uh, you know, some of those non-conference schedules, some of those metrics were in their favor, and they get in. They go into Coral Gables Regional. Uh, they go to Hattiesburg and shut out Southern Miss, yeah. a really good Southern Miss team. So those are the two for me. Like Arkansas. They, if you're a Texas baseball fan, like you've seen a lot of Arkansas, and, and I think we all kind of had an eye on that Stillwater regional, um, and, and then Auburn finishing it off in Corvallis. But, man, Stanford and Ole Miss, I'm just really intrigued by them. Stanford maybe more so than Ole Miss. Jeff, are you a big UFC or boxing guy at all? No, not really. Okay. Well, I just want to <laughs> – Sorry. The, no, you're so good. But the Arkansas-Stillwater uh, regional – like what they did with Oklahoma State just battling back, it felt like a really kind of sloppy but fun heavyweight super fight where haymakers are just being thrown. Yeah, okay, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of home runs being hit. Maybe the pitching isn't that great, but it's just a ton of fun and it's kind of like kind of like a throwback Big Twelve football game. Like, yeah, absolutely. Right. Seventy to sixty three, Baylor West Virginia. All right, yeah, this is like I think about the Texas Baylor game in twenty twelve. Like, okay, you won fifty six fifty, but I don't think anybody had any fun watching <laughs> this. Exactly. Somebody won on the scoreboard, but I don't know. I don't know that anybody really won. You know what I'm <laughs> Just survival, exactly. But that was another one. I think when 
we kind of realized that Texas would be hosting everybody, even though Arkansas really was limping into the postseason, you still didn't want to see them as that two spot in your regional. Oh. And I think Oklahoma State got a short straw. And uh, as you can see with how Arkansas has ended up in Omaha, uh, those fears were correct. So overall, my prediction, I do think I, – I hate to do this, but Oklahoma is so hot that – I kind and they have the pitching as well as the bats. I'm going to pick them to advance from the left side of the bracket, and I'm going to actually pick Auburn to pick from the right side. And I won't predict uh, OU baseball national championship after their softball team just absolutely obliterated Texas. So Auburn, congrats or sorry for the curse. I'll tell you this: um, I do feel like it'll be Texas and Oklahoma in a winners bracket game. I think the winner of that winners bracket game gets the job done because even, even in Omaha with the built-in would, days off, like we we've seen it through the regionals and the supers, man, it is so tough to come out of the loser's bracket just because it, at some point you're going to run out of arms. So I think whichever tech, because we, we talk about how it sets up for Texas, man, if you, if you can win the first two, you set yourself up really nicely. You give yourself some margin for error to get to the championship series. So I, I think it's going to be Texas and OU on Sunday. Uh, in yeah, it would be the rubber match. They're they've played four times. They split the four. Uh, who's going to win the fifth? I think whoever wins that Sunday game between Texas and OU, I think they get there. I think that's your national champion. Hell yeah, Jeff! Thank you so much for the time. When are you leaving for Omaha? So I will leave Thursday uh, Thursday around lunchtime. And based on hotel reservations, rental car, all that, I'm. Planning to be there through Monday the 27th, which is if the championship series gets to a third game, that's when it'll be. So I'm looking forward to it, man. I, I went 14 was the first time I, I went and didn't know what to expect. And lo and behold, a Texas team that probably, quite frankly, had no business being there uh, was in a winner take all with Vanderbilt trying to get there. Uh, didn't go in 18. And, uh, you know, with COVID protocols last year, kind of made going not make sense. But I'll tell you this, like, you look at and yeah, I know you can talk economics and uh, prices are what they are with inflation and everything. But you've got you think about this like Oklahoma hasn't been there since twenty I think twenty ten last time Oklahoma was in Omaha. Uh, you got A and M with Schloss and they're there and they got a chance. Uh, Auburn's there. You've got and, and Texas fans kind of know the deal going to Omaha, but really with uh, with Oklahoma, Notre Dame, and Auburn. You've got three really passionate, really large fan bases that suddenly have a reason to care about going to Omaha. Yeah. This, I think, Hudson, this will be the most exciting, thrilling, hyped-up College World Series that we've seen. And I, I love college baseball. I love this for college baseball because, again, with Tennessee out of it, I, I was looking at the odds today. Like, A&M has the lowest odds. Yeah, A&M. At, at, eight, at eight to one, though. Yeah. So, like – you're ba so basically what Vegas is saying is this thing is a coin flip. Yeah. Is and, basically what they're saying. And the best odds I've seen are either 425 or plus 475 for either Texas or Stanford. The power ratings yeah. do not love A&M. Uh, just like the analytic uh, models just really are not a fan of the Aggies, which I find pretty interesting. Uh, they also haven't been a fan of Oklahoma, and Oklahoma's been just uh, cashing as underdogs throughout the regionals. Yeah, o Oklahoma Oklahoma have had some – you know, I, actually, what's funny, I'll just get into this real quick. We got time for me to do this real quick. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what was the difference between Oklahoma hosting and not? Everybody looked at the Globe Live, the series of Globe Live, like, oh, that should have counted as a neutral side game. Here's why it didn't. And I think this is why Oklahoma didn't host. Oklahoma had a non conference series in February against Northwestern State. And they asked the folks at Globe Life and the Rangers, hey, winter weather, can we play it down there? Okay, you can, but we're going to want you to move a conference series here. And, and we're going to want it to be Texas. And Texas wouldn't have done that unless, okay, we want the RPI bump for that being a road series. Like, we can, we'll can, we move it, but we want to make – because you get more points. The RPI benefits you much more to play a road game than a neutral side game. So that's what happened. But in that non-conference series, Hudson, Oklahoma lost one of those games to Northwestern State. So that's one of those – I think they had five – five sub 150 R, sub 150 RPI losses this year. And remember that week when uh everybody's concerned about RPI and all the midweek games got canceled? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that week OU went on the road 
and lost 18 nothing to Wichita State. So a couple of unfortunate breaks were the reason, were the main reasons why Oklahoma didn't host was because of a couple of, and I think that's what some of the metrics didn't like Oklahoma was because of the uh, the, uh, the non conference stuff. But also, that's a team that got hot really late, probably a little too late maybe to host. Mm-hmm. But man, I I do not want to see them. Right Absolutely. Now. Absolutely not. And Jeff, you know this, but like with college football and college uh, basketball, in addition to MLB, all of the professional sports, college football with SP plus college basketball with Ken Palm, you have these established political models where with college baseball, you're finding out that people on the fly are starting to realize, oh, God, we've got to really start factoring in for recency a lot more because these teams do go on runs. The, yeah. You know what matter what happened in March really doesn't matter as much with college baseball as some of the other sports where you kind of have a more stable sample size. Yeah, and I think too, like like with college basketball, the fact that you've got Ken Palm and Bart Torvik, and you've got all these different metrics that weigh different things. Um, if there's something like that for college baseball, I'm not aware of it. You just got the RPI, and that's pretty much it. And, and a couple of low level uh, sites trying to kind of get yeah. in on. And I know, I know Kendall Rogers and the guys at D1 Baseball, they do a good job of tracking it. And they've got, you know, you can find kind of your your meat and potatoes metrics, so your RPI, your non-conference strength schedule, non-conference RPI, uh, kind of your quadrant law, quadrant records and things like that. But, yeah, I, I think if there's somebody that's got enough time and more brain power than I've got, if you can do kind of what Ken Palm or Bart Twervick has done for college basketball, I do think – because now – you know, with the selection committee for college basketball, it used to be they would just maybe consider the RPI, and that was wow. it, not look at these in the metric. Now, every, that, that selection committee for the basketball tournament, everything, everything is on the table. So I, I feel like – and then this year, you really needed in college baseball this year because it was such a – man, it was so – like the bubble was so small. Like West a team like West Virginia, like you finished with a winning record yeah. And what was the Big 12? I think the number three RPI conference. West Virginia, NC State. Yeah. You finish with a winning record in a top three RPI league. Dude, nine years out of 10, you're in. Like, Absolutely. no question. West Virginia was so far off the bubble, I don't even know where they were. So, yeah, you do need you do need to fix it. Sorry for nerding out there, but yeah, you, no, I, I would I'm like to see, I, absolutely. Yeah, I would like to see something like that for college baseball for sure. Or just or you can have the RPI, but get something else to go with it. Absolutely. And also, one last kind of point on that: <laughs> the RPI is not the most um, complex uh, no. algorithm, and so when you have staffs who schedule with it in mind and it's less about play and more about gaming the system it kind of loses a little bit of that value in my well and, and I'll, t- I'll take it from texas standpoint uh because it's, it's the system you've got to work within right yeah why do you think david pierce wanted to go play a midweek game at utrgv why do they play two road games at AM corpus why after you play a road series in south carolina why do you go do a double midweek with the what citadel and call to charleston Man, because even if you lose those games, it does the RPI doesn't ding you as much for playing a road game. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's the system. That's the way it is, and it helped Texas. For sure. Jeff, you'll be in Omaha covering the College World Series. I guess one more little thing. Do you have a food – do you have a go-to spot food-wise in Omaha? People will be listening um, probably Thursday, so a chance if there are any traveling Horns fans. It's been a minute since I've been up there. Uh, if you know, if you're, you can find you a good steakhouse. Like Cashio's is going to be the, the steakhouse everybody goes to. But I, I'll tell you what's funny, um, Omaha and Craig Wade. Craig's giving me the history lesson, like how why Omaha has so many Italian steakhouses. And like the short version is, like in the late 1800s when the railroad was getting built, there were a lot of Italian immigrants in the state of Nebraska, helping build the railroad. And you did one or two jobs. You either built the railroad or you fed the people building the railroad. So that's why you got a lot. So basically, so I don't know. You ever been to Omaha? That's I haven't just, actually. Nebraska. Okay. So like if you go to an Italian steakhouse in Omaha, like normally you go to a steakhouse, what are your sides, right? Like maybe a baked potato or something like that. Man, in Oklahoma, in, uh, in Nebraska, in Omaha, when they bring you your steak, they bring you like a side of spaghetti to go with it. <laughs> So it's kind of hard to wrap your head around, but man, there's there's so you you'll run into some good steak houses in Omaha. That's the big deal. You get your good steak um, in Omaha. That's that's the winner. 
Perfect. This has been the Talking Texas podcast, talking some Texas baseball with Horns 24-7's Jeff Howe. Make sure to follow all of uh, Jeff's coverage from Omaha as Texas goes for another national title in their 38th appearance at the College World Series. Thanks, everybody.